I call this meeting to order. Welcome everyone to tonight's Board of Education meeting. We do not have the NJROTC, so we'll uh, put the presentation to the public. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Williams. Yeah, glad everybody can join us this evening. It's good to celebrate our Teachers of the Year. Uh, one of the things that's great about celebrating our Teachers of the Year is that we named them earlier in the school year tonight and get the opportunity to recognize our nine uh, Teachers of the Year. We are very blessed to be a part and uh, a partnership with the Doug and Kate Ivester Foundation. Uh, the Ivester helped funds our Teacher of the Year celebration. So all of our Teachers of the Year tonight uh, received a $500 award for being recognized by their peers, and the district recipient received a $10,000 award for being the uh, district's recipient. So tonight uh, it is the only recognition we have. We did have uh, some of our students getting recognized as region winners uh, in the fall, and then also soon to be winter sports, but uh, we had to cancel that uh, due to just some scheduling conflicts with the number uh, of our student athletes. So we will be doing that in, in the near future. So what I'd like to do is do something a little different than, than what we've done in the past. Usually we call all nine of them at the same time. And then we just have one big picture to go home. But tonight we'll make it a little bit longer because we don't have other recognitions. So we're going to call you up one school at a time. Our first teacher of the year uh, is from Centennial Arts Academy, Ms. Fancy Bennett. Uh, Fancy's husband, Steve, is one of our new board members. And you can see that he's not here tonight, nor is Fancy. So we were recognizing a teacher uh, meeting. Uh, but we're definitely glad that Centennial Arts Academy uh, gets to celebrate uh, Ms. Fancy Bay. I'd now like to ask if I could, Dr. Roach, uh, if you would just kind of wave your hand, let everybody know we know it. Uh, and tell the Multiple Intelligence Academy is here being represented by Ms. Rhonda Moss. Ms. Rhonda Moss, if you would please take a look up. Ms. Moss, you've been in the district for how long? Six years. Six years. Fifth grade? Yeah. Extraordinary. I will tell you that Ms. Moss teaches my son, but that is not why she got teaching <laughs> here. <laughs> but but I do endorse this choice. <laughs> so board members, y'all will join us on this side and get a picture of Ms. Moss. Any family members want to take a picture? Yeah. Right. You want to come take a picture with mom? Come on. Come on. Come on. <laughs> All right, Joey, let's get another picture if we can. Do you say cheeks? Good job, buddy. You're doing good. Thank you. From Ferris Street International Academy, Ms. Courtney Jones, if you will please make it your way. Courtney, are you here with us this evening? All right, we have two that are not with us this evening. From uh, Gainesville Exploration Academy, I saw Ms. Noel Martin come on in. Ms. Noel, if you would join us, please. Ms. Noel, how many years have you been with us? Five. Ms. Boatwright, wave at everybody. Any family members want to come up? Come on. Come on. Look, we, we understand that as teachers of the year, there are a lot of sacrifices that you see in the home, and, and, and you're here as well. So, yes, it is, it is a joint effort. Congratulations. Thank you. One other thing I'd like to add is uh, we kicked off this year at Superintendent's Advisory Herd, and as a part of that herd, all of our teachers of the year and last year's Heroes of the Herd get to serve on that, and I usually around to about four times a year just to learn a little bit more about what's going on in the school. So we do appreciate your participation in that. Uh, from New Holland Leadership Academy, and I think you brought the biggest crew tonight. Miss Stovall, please come on up.
How many years? Nine years. <laughs> you got any family wants to come up? I have an army. Come on, army. Come on. Looks like we got to slide out a little bit. <laughs> Congratulations. From Gainesville Middle School East, Dr. Hannah Ray. How many years? Nine of us. Very good. Have you survived? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> All right, let's miss you. Yeah. Have you got any family that want to come up? Sure. Uh, no. <laughs> You're being, su <laughs> being summoned now. Just came for. Oh, you're good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. From Gainesville Middle School West, Miss Jennifer Pendleton. How many years, Jennifer? Eight years? Which really counts as 16 at middle school. <laughs> Hold on, Mr. Mayor's taking it. Did you get it? <laughs> Hold on. It's good. Got anyone come up? Yeah, on a cruise. Thank you. You know, we think we can be here since we're on that cruise. We're going to go to high school, Miss Sandra Plaston. Ms. Claxton, how many years? Eight years. You got any family roles to come on up? They might. Come on. Twenty twenty three graduate. <laughs> You ever had your mom? <laughs> <laughs> she was in. She was looking there. <laughs> and from Monday Mill Arts Academy, as well as our district teacher of the year, our fourth grade teacher, Miss Anna Orphan. <laughs> You got any family wants to come up? Yeah. I know. <laughs> you got some little ones that probably want to come. Congratulations. We can now have all of our recipients for Teachers of the Year to please join us up here for one big group picture.
Let's move on on that. And now, like any good teacher, line yourself up either based by birthday. <laughs> All right, we have one more picture there for access. Great job, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> All right, do we have any board commendations? John? Good evening, my name is Stacey Owen. I represent District 3. And today I had an opportunity to attend Vestry and Sweeney Brunch. It was a great event, great turnout. So if you missed it this year, we look forward to having you next year. And that's a time where they come together to showcase and give you the history of uh, Black History Month and to talk about how we're all students going forward. So thank you all the today. Uh, any citizens' comments? No citizens' comments. That does end the recognition portion of our meeting. We are going to go into our formal business. You're welcome to stay, uh, but it is a good time to leave if you need to. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Um, we do have some visitors here from Leadership Hall, so I am going to ask them to introduce themselves and tell us which organization they're in. You can do it from there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go to your call. I'm going to go to your call. My name is Mark Blair. I'm going to work for our office of the Stasky McDonald's franchisee. Uh, my name is Jess Park. I'm the client manager of Ralph for the Asphalt Table Conference. All right, well, welcome, y'all. Appreciate hey. it. Hey. 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 All right, do I have the next one? I would like to make a motion that we adopt Roman numeral four and five. I've got a motion on four by Mr. Nordholz that are here to second. I've got a second by Dr. Ramsey. All those in favor? Motion carried. Thank you. Uh, first item of information is from Dr. Paula Rufus to go over the assessment of the Dr. Rufus. One of the things I've asked you to notice in the last meeting as well, uh, with a couple of new board members, I thought it would be a great opportunity over the next few months to hear from some of our departments, uh, just to kind of orient you to some of the work that we do uh, that sometimes we kind of take for, take for granted. And so I asked Dr. Rufus to give us a little bit of information about our system. And colleague, uh, I'm sure you read this, you did a very good job of uh, being concise as far as uh, explaining all the assessments that are given in, in our district. Thank you. Typically, we look at um, the time after the national holidays, beginning in January to the end of the year, in our testing season. But in essence, we test all year long, starting with the first day of school. Um, I didn't highlight every assessment there. The ones um, on the board report are those. 
sometimes we refer to those as high stakes tests. Those are the state mandated assessments. But I'll just go very briefly over some of the other assessments that take place in our school. Um, GK is, and as you all know, we're educators, so we use a lot of acronyms. So GK is the kindergarten inventory that is administered throughout the year for kindergarten students. And the purpose is to really monitor and um, assess how well students are progressing toward readiness for first grade. And so teachers start, that window opens the first day of school and um, they're tested throughout the school year. Uh, those students are assessed in ELA, math, science, and social studies are optional, but they're also assessed with their personal social development as well. Keeping in mind that a lot of these students, their first school experience is kindergarten. Many of them attend pre-K or may not have even been in um, daycares. We also, at the local level, we require that um, our elementary and middle school students participate in universal swimmers. These are formative assessments that really the purpose of those is to get information to determine how teachers can personalize instruction and also to kind of gauge how, uh, how well students are moving towards proficiency um, in our state mandated assessments. So, uh, some of these assessments have been proven to serve as predictors of students' performance on the Georgia milestones, which is what we consider our performance uh, one that I say. Uh, now we are in B-testing season. Uh, we start January 10th with assessing our English learners with the access for ELs for the English learners. And um, we have, we are wrapping that up this week as a matter of fact. And we tested over 2,500 students for this. And so um, that approximately one third of our post student population. And the access test is for students who are, um, who've been identified as needing ESOL services, so English to speak of other languages. Students who, um, okay, I'm sorry. So all of our students are required to participate in assess in state assessment. All students, including students who have English uh, learners designation, as well as students with the most significant cognitive disabilities. So we are required as a district to ensure that all students are administered the appropriate assessment. And we're also required to ensure that at least 95% of our students are uh, tested. For the English learners, going back to that one for access, those students who are English learners and also have significant cognitive disabilities, they are administered the alternate access. As I mentioned, we are wrapping up assessment for the um, access for English learners. And this really is a season. As we finish one assessment, the next one comes on board. So there's really no risk, really, with the testing uh, cycle now. So we wrap up with the access, but then we're preparing for the Georgia alternate assessment, we call it GAA, and that's the assessment that all students with significant cognitive disabilities in grades three through high school participate in those tests. And so for the GAA, only a very small percentage of our students participate. Our um, goal is that 1% or less participate in the Georgia Alternate Assessment. The majority of our students are um, instructed using our standards, the general standards um, that are put forth by Georgia Standards of Excellence, and then there are a few who are educated using alternate uh, standards, and so they will participate in the Georgia Alternate Assessment. And then finally, the program that most people are familiar with is the Georgia Milestones. We have the Georgia Milestones in the course that's for the high school students in certain courses, and then the Georgia Milestones in the grade, those for students in grades three through eight. For high school, there are four courses that students were assessed in, and currently it's American Literature and Composition, 
algebra, we have a new math assessment now because of the new math standards. It's algebra it used to be algebra one, now it's algebra with concepts and connections. And then we also have biology and U.S. history. So any high school students enrolled in those courses are required to um, take the corresponding end of course test in that area. So the end of course assessments are considered the final exam for these students, and it counts as 20% of those students are final grade. <clears throat> I mentioned that the algebra um, course is new this year, so we won't have results for those students in time to get a final 20% of their grades, so teachers are going to be required to use other measures to determine students' proficiency in the algebra. Uh, that Typically, when we have a new assessment, well, when we set new standards, then we have to provide um, assessments that meet those standards. Then we have to go through standard setting to determine what now becomes proficient. And so educators from across the state get together with the DOE's guidance and make those determinations. Um, and so that won't happen to the summers, and we won't have um, results back until fall. Of 2024, and that's why the teachers will have to give the students another measure for final exam this year. And that window opens April 12th. Um, I have just a couple of updates or new things uh, that are happening that will be happening. Um, at its January 24th, I mean, I'm sorry, January 2024 uh, board meeting, the State Department of Education amended the assessment rule. Um, to adopt the mathematics, which we've already talked about, in ELA standards. Um, next year will be the last year that students will be required to take the American Literature Assessment or in the course. The um, State Department is moving towards um, developing, the course is not developed yet, but it's out there that they're developing a new um, English language art course. And that course will be for 10th grade students. Um, for the most part, American literature and composition has been referred to as the 11th grade um, ELA course. So now those students will no longer test, but students will test in 10th grade. And right now, that course is being called uh, Literature and Composition 2. And the students will not be responsible for testing in that course until the 25-26 school year. So uh, again, we'll go through the same process, let's say we we'll go through the same process of doing standard setting, but um, in fact, in 25-26, those 10th grade students will be required to take an end course assessment as well. Uh, yeah. And then finally, um, the State Board of Education has approved an exemption from the GKIS ELA component. Um, for the GKIS, the kindergarten inventory that I mentioned earlier, they are assessed on the ELA, English Language Arts, Math, Science, and Social Studies. So the State Department is providing an exemption from the language arts portion of that if districts have in place a um, Universal Screener that can satisfy some of those requirements. And since we've been administering Universal Screeners for a while, our students will be exempted from that ELA portion of the um, GKIS. And we made the decision to take advantage of this exemption effective next school year. Any questions about this? One, one thing I'd like to add is those of you who've had uh, children go through the high school uh, and that 20% and then of course that account for the final exam, uh, that is now changing for us. So they, they changed the law last year that uh, you could go less than that. Uh, we got that notification from everybody else and kind of late and did not feel it was uh, really wise for us to change all the crazy structures we had in the campus for this school year. But next school year, that'll go down to 10%. So all of our finals then, because we also parallel whatever the DOC percentage is to all of our other finals on the high school level. And so next year, all of our finals will count 10% of the overall grade instead of the previous 20%, which is good news for 
a lot of kids it may be borderline because when you when you may be a low A, low B, a low C, uh, and, and your final exam is 20 percent, that can change a lot of things. So we're excited to, to say that we'll be bumping that down to 10 percent next week. Any other questions? Thank you. Next item is a special education update. Scott. Welcome. Good evening. I'm excited to share with you all the great right things that we're doing in our department. Before I do that, I'm going to ask my incredible leadership team to raise their hands and wave because they're here tonight. Much of what I'm going to talk about is the direct result of the work that they do every day in our schools. Um, so, whenever you receive communication from our department, you're going to see three guiding principles. Our department operates on the principles of compassion, consistency, and clarity. We approach every student and family with a deep sense of compassion so we can develop a positive and collaborative relationship. They understand that providing for students with disabilities truly embodies the phrase, it takes a village, and strong relationships between home and school are imperative to ensure success for those students. Um, the only thing constant in special education is that things are always changing. So it's imperative that we adhere to federal and state guidelines of deliberately delivering consistent messaging to our schools so that they can best serve their students. Finally, we're clear that we expect our students with disabilities to receive a rigorous education, but we must deliver high quality professional development to teachers so that they are fully prepared to deliver that instruction. This year, our team has implemented monthly make and take sessions, so teachers are able to leave our PE sessions with actionable materials. Our team uh, also provides a variety of one on one small group sessions that are tailored to meet individual teacher needs based on their students. We serve students with disabilities from ages 3 to 21 years old. Students transition to us from the Baby Can't Wait program before their third birthday, and depending on their needs, can remain in the school system through their 21st birthday. Our department has experienced significant growth over the last 15 years, and if you will look at the graph, you'll notice a sharp increase in the last five years, and it should come as no surprise that we've seen a sharp increase in our members since COVID. Um, we're charged with identifying students with disabilities, and on average, we conduct over 150 evaluations per year to determine eligibility for service. While we serve 13 eligibility categories, there are three areas where we serve the greatest amount of students, specific learning disabilities, significant developmental delay, and autism. Again, if you'll notice, those students identified under the autism umbrella have more than doubled since then. Because we've experienced significant growth over the past five years, we've had to adjust how we provide services in order to better meet the needs of the students we serve. There are three programs we have developed that I want to highlight. Two years ago, we introduced our first transition kindergarten program at Year Three. The vision of this program is to provide an authentic kindergarten experience to students with disabilities. The class size is small, with a focus on school readiness skills but it's through the delivery of the traditional kindergarten curriculum. As students demonstrate all mastery, we're able to transition them into general education environments with their peers. The program proved so successful that we're excited to add a second classroom and gain some exploration next school year. And that will allow us to have one for clusters uh, as opposed to trying to get it all the way to the cluster. Um, we're also focusing on functional life skills through a variety of methods, methods to ensure our students with disabilities transition to meaningful employment and education opportunities after high school. We've introduced a CPI coordinator in the high school this year who works with our students with disabilities to match them with post secondary opportunities. The high school continues to run the case lab that was introduced in 2018. We've also been able to reinstate community based instruction since COVID, so students are able to practice those functional skills in our community. As you saw in our previous slide, the students we serve with autism has increased dramatically. We have established classrooms designed to meet their needs specifically. These classrooms have the support of board certified behavior analysts, access to augmentative and alternative communication devices opportunities to practice functional social and communication skills, and we are currently working to establish such free rooms in all of our communities. 
Three years ago, the district made a commitment to provide an adaptive playground equipment to our students with disabilities to help progress promote an inclusive playground equipment for our students with disabilities. We have sensory items, wheelchair swings, and adaptive support swings on all of our elementary playgrounds. This spring, in collaboration with high school construction classes, we're going to install communication boards on every playground. These boards will allow students and other means of communication while enjoying the And then I just want to leave you with this quote. Um, our ultimate vision for our students with disabilities is that they, they experience fully inclusive education in their peers. Um, our leadership team has been working through the book, Way to Inclusion, How Leaders Create Schools Where Every Student Belongs. And this quote struck me and has kind of um, led our, our work this school year. Every student is valued because of their strengths, gifts, needs, and challenges. Disability is simply diversity. Everyone benefits from meaningful participation and opportunities to learn great all the time. So, I have a good question for me. A new question? I have a question. Yeah, the increase in autism that we've seen since COVID, is that just due to the isolation that they experienced and sensory overload now? We have seen the big sense that the opportunities just weren't there for students, even to be in grocery stores or going to church, it's not sure. You know, to name on soccer or something, they're just not exposed to the other language and um, peer opportunities that they might have been on the playground, and they're just natural in a child's early childhood day at church, those kind of things. So I think that that's a direct result of those lack of opportunities for Just to give you an idea of how much it has grown, uh, just in my seven years here, next year will almost triple the amount of self contained classes we had uh, in the district. Um, in, in seven years. So that just tells you they're moving here. The resources here are great, uh, but it does put a burden on our, our human resources. Uh, Dana and I had a conversation, I think last year was our first year, this year is our second year, for all of our self contained teachers get extended day. So that means they get 60% of their salary or six of their salary back into their salary because we realize often I'm not going to be correct. Uh, and so it's a way, it's really helped us from a retention standpoint of keeping our self contained teachers from going somewhere else. We do have a really great retention rate among those teachers that service the province population. It's been really great. Any other questions? Thank you, Jamie. Sure. All right. Uh, first action item is the approval of the January 2024 financial statements. Ms. Bethel. Good evening. I am Jane Ferris with the more financial statements. Our revenue came out of January was at 6.6 million. Six point six million. Year to date revenues are at 74.5 million. That's 77.3% uh, of our budget of revenues. This time last year, we were at 75.5. So that's us being there. We are 97, 98.7 collected percentage for property tax revenues. And this time last year, we were at 95.8% collected. So there's us being uh, early collections there with property taxes uh, at this time. Our expenditures came in at 8.7 million in the month of January. We were at expenditures slightly up to the 8 million. That's 59.8% of uh, our budgeted expenditures. Uh, this time last year, we were at 63.5%, which is slightly elevated. So that was due to the $3 million um, transfer to capital projects. So that um, is pretty much um, due to that. All in all, this time of the year, which is our seventh month, we just finished our delay. Uh, we're going to finish for the eighth day, that was the second time. Um, and we did ask Ms. Beth to back out the amount that we set aside for those capital projects, and we were right in line with the 59.8% uh, this year as we were last year. We know a lot of those are front loaded in some respective operations and technology. And so some of those percentages don't uh, necessarily uh, keep up with that same momentum. Just like. 
Mr. Dunn, can we go back to the uh, top of that? One question I had, I'm sure you explained this to us before, sir, forgive me, but the title and the lore on the TABT, um, I know that's not a huge line item, but it looks like we're on with just over 50% of that collected. Is that the norm? Well, what's the difference in that and the ad norm? Yeah, so the TABT reviews, right? And we wind up, um, we went up a little bit higher than the budget. We've been collecting about $2 million. And so keep in mind that TABT is monthly sales. So it was like, so 51.6 is slightly below where we would be seven months in, uh, but not far off. Okay. If we say we need to adjust that line on the we can do that. But it's probably a pretty close to me. Yeah. Um, excuse me, our sponsor speaks in that for the library units. One hundred and fifty-seven thousand. So we still maintain that over one million dollar collections um, per month. Yeah, that's the highest. Okay. <laughs> that's how we fixed it. Any, any other questions for Mrs. Scott? All right. Do we have a motion to approve the uh, January financial statements? So moved. Motion by <laughs> Dr. Randy, you got a second by Mr. Young. All those in favor? Much of case, thank you, Mr. Douglas. Right now, we have a motion to adjourn into two executive sessions. So, we got a motion by Mr. Young. Thank you, Dr. Randy. All those in favor? Much of case, thank you all for coming tonight. Ladies and gentlemen.